Have you heard of the boring billion? Who decided it was so boring anyway? And is the boring billion even real? Let's find out with the help of those meddling kids and their pesky dog. Hi everyone, my name is Dr. Brooke Johnson and I'm a geologist who studies mud that's billions of years old and the tiny wee fossils that we find in that mud. This channel is where I talk about geology and all earth science related things that I find interesting. So if there's a topic you want me to talk about, let me know in the comments down below. If you like my work, then press all of the buttons to let the robot overlords know and they'll send the videos directly into your brain as soon as they drop. If you hear any strange noises from that way, it's because I'm being studied by an anthropologist who's studying our research group because we're an astrobiology group and she's interested in the anthropological aspects of astrobiology. So she's studying us the same way that we'd study our tiny little fossils in really old mud. And with that out of the way, let's crack on. That was terrible. There we go. The Boring Billion is the unofficial name for an interval of time between 1,800 million years ago, or 1.8 billion if you prefer, and about 800 million years ago, with a bit of wiggle room on either side. I say it's unofficial because official time intervals, like say for example the Jurassic or the Paleozoic, um, have a globally accepted start and end point marked by specific global events, global events, global events, like mass extinctions or the appearance of new types of fossils. For example, the start of the Jurassic is marked by the first appearance of the Ammonites. Generally, the start and end of those points is fixed with an imaginary or sometimes real golden spike, like this one which marks the boundary between the Cryogenian and Ediacaran periods in Australia. In the Precambrian Superion, the official time divisions are based on radiometric dates that we have decided because they're useful points. This is because there's not enough rock left from these intervals to fully understand if there were real global events at this time. And also, the fossils we find far back in the Precambrian tend to have very long time ranges of hundreds of millions of years, which limits their use as markers for geological time. Typically, the fossils that we use for marking out geological time in younger rocks are only around for short time periods of only a few million years. I'm call this biostratigraphy, and if you want a video about that, let me know. So the start and the end of the Boring Billion tend to shift around depending on who you talk to and what part of geology they actually study. So because of this and the reasons above, it's never been made into an official time interval. There's also the question of if the Boring Billion was even real. So how did the name come about? There are several names for this interval of time, including the dullest period in Earth's history, but most people will refer to it as the Mid-Proterozoic, because it's around about the middle of the Proterozoic eon. Several people came up with the term boring billion separately at around the same time, which is a common thing that happens in science. So I'm just gonna tell you the version of it that I was told when I was a PhD student at Oxford in the UK. And that story goes something like this. Two geologists were studying mid-proterozoic rocks from Northern Australia. One was the late Martin Brazier, who was a prominent researcher in Precambrian and early Paleozoic paleontology. I knew there was a geologist called John Lindsay from I think the Western Australia Geological Survey. Both Brazier and Lindsay were prolific researchers in Precambrian geology. They were studying a drill core from the northernmost northern territory which contained mostly carbonate rocks of a type called dolomite. The rock units in the core were separated into three main groups by unconformities and unconformities are boundaries in the rock record where there's either been no deposition or there's been erosion and so these boundaries represent very long gaps in, in time. Brazier and Lindsay knew that the rocks in the middle didn't really represent a billion years worth of Earth history because it was just a few hundred metres of rock, but they had no other dates to work with at the time, so they had to go with what they had. The Northern Territory is a really big place and most of the Precambrian rocks are still underground, which is great because it means they've been protected by weathering, but it's difficult to link them all together because you've only got these thin drill cores, which are like grain pipes of rock that you've got from underneath the ground. Even today, people like me and my colleagues in Australia are still trying to piece together all of these different rock units that we found from the drill core process. Brazier and Lindsay analyse the carbon and oxygen isotopes in the carbonate rocks in the middle of the drill core, and that's a standard way to investigate ancient environments. Let me know if you want a video about how we use isotopes in earth sciences. It's a really big topic and we can do lots of different things with them. When they got the isotope data, they found something quite strange. The graph for each isotope was nearly a straight line with only a few tiny little wiggles in it. But why is that so strange? The ratio of carbon and oxygen isotopes in the atmosphere and oceans is controlled by Earth processes like climate change, erosion and the action of biology on a large scale. It's too big a topic for me to go into in details here though, but in very simple terms, as the climate cools and warms, the isotope ratios of carbon and oxygen swing about from positive and negative values. So if you have like a rapid global warming event or a rapid global cooling event, your, your isotopes will swing one way or, do, or the other by quite a big thing. We call these isotope excursions. 
Again, I need to stress that this is a super simplified explanation. It's a lot more detail and nuance I'm leaving out to keep this simple. If you'd like to know about it though, let me know in the comments and I'll make a wee video about it. If we look at the history of the Earth from the perspective of carbon and oxygen isotope curves, we can see these big peaks and valleys that coincide with times when the Earth was either really warm or really cold, or when there was a rapid change in the climate. I'm wafting my hand around like crazy. We can see global events like the Great Oxygenation Event and the Ice Ages that went with it. We can see the Cryogenian Ice Ages. This flat bit in the middle, that's the Boring Billion. There are no major wiggles in the isotopes, so no major excursions, as far as we know. And this is interpreted to mean that the climate was very stable and pretty warm for a very long time. When he saw the data, John Lindsay was said to have commented something along the lines of, if these carbonates do really represent a billion years, then it was a very boring billion years. But only in terms of the isotope system and the climate. However, as more people began to investigate rocks from this interval from across the world, they started to find the same thing in carbonate rocks, very flat carbon and oxygen isotope curves. And some researchers have suggested that the average global temperature would have been relatively warm throughout this whole period. And when I say relatively warm, I mean the entire Earth's surface ocean would have felt like a nice warm bath, even at the poles. We see similar unusual trends in other parts of the Earth's system during this time. Metal ores at this time, for example, are dominated by a type that we, of deposit we call volcanogenic massive sulfides. I got that in one go, I'm very proud of myself. VMS deposits are related to continental rifting and ocean plate growth and continents splitting apart. Conversely, we don't see many of the ore deposits associated with continental collisions or the associated metamorphic rocks of that. Some do exist, but they're not as widespread as they are during other periods of Earth history. We also see lots of oil deposits during this time and associated iron and phosphate bearing sedimentary rocks. In fact, the oldest oil in the world is from this time and that's one of the rocks that I study. In fact, if you've ever wondered what oil shale looks like, this is where oil comes from. This is a piece of 1.4 billion year old oil shale. It's got lots of little microbial textures all over the surface of it that you probably can't see. I can smell the hydrocarbons, stinks. These oil, phosphate and iron deposits require stable environments and low oxygen with lots of nutrients input to form. This type of environment is often found in inland seas, and flooded areas of continent fed by large rivers on stable continental areas that we call Cretonic Basins. Sounds like something from Star Wars, that. The Empire has invaded the Cretonic Basin. And subsequently, most of the surviving sedimentary rocks from this time are found in these Cretonic Basins. For continental basins to be stable for so long is very unusual. So it looks like the normal processes of continents rifting and colliding and recycling had also stalled and become stable during this period. And if you're thinking it's a bit weird that most of the rock, sedimentary rocks from this time come from these stable cratonic basins, well done. We'll talk about that in a minute. The fossil record also appears to support a very boring mid-proterozoic interval. The preceding Archean and early to mid-paleoproterozoic eras had been dominated by bacteria, but by the late Proterozoic, more complex eukaryotic organisms had evolved. Eukaryotes include everything from amoebas all the way through to the ape presenting this video and the ones watching it. However, after their initial appearance, eukaryotes don't really seem to diversify and the ecosystems they inhabit remain dominated by bacteria until after the cryogenian ice ages. We find plenty of eukaryotic microfossils though, such as these ones I'm showing you on screen now, that were found by my boss, Manuel Javot, 20 years ago in the same rock unit that, I, that I'm looking at where that black shale I showed you comes from. We know these are eukaryotes because their relatively complex features cannot be made by bacteria but we don't know what kind of eukaryotes they were because they do not have enough features for us to compare them to living micro eukaryotes. We think that most of them are resting cysts, which is like a little protective sleeping bag that some modern micro eukaryotes, also called protists, make in order to hibernate difficult environmental conditions. We call these microfossils acrotarchs, and this literally means of uncertain origin or of uncertain affinity. And that's why I chose it as the name of my band because my music is stupid. We call them acrotarchs because we can't place them within the wider tree of life, so we give them their own special little bracket. Sometimes we, can, we, we find fossils where we can then identify what an acrotarch actually is, and then it gets removed from being an acrotarch and placed in the proper category. Also, up to this point, no one had found any macro fossils in rocks of this age, as in ones that you can see with the naked eye, that you could unambiguously identify and place within the wider tree of life. 
There are these ambiguous macro fossils, like these spirals called Grapania spiralis, and then these string of beads called Horodischia, but we still don't know what kind of organisms these represent. And some researchers even suggest that they're not fossils at all, they're just sedimentary structures where the currents and waves have been moving bits of sediment around. My personal opinion, though, just between you and me, is that Grapania and Horodischia are actually both fossils, not sedimentary structures. If you'd like a video about problematic fossils like Horodischia and Grapania, let me know in the comments below and I'll see what I can work out. So why did the Earth system become so stable for such a long period of time? One idea is that the low amount of oxygen in the atmosphere and oceans at this time meant that there should be low amounts of nutrients being released into the sea by oxygenic weathering. So as you know, oxygen likes to corrode and rust things and when it does that to rocks, it releases nutrients trapped in those rocks which get carried down to the sea and then that's where biology can use them. If there's low oxygen in the atmosphere or no oxygen, you get a different kind of weathering and not as many nutrients are released. Low nutrients in the ocean means low levels of oxygenic photosynthesis, which means that there's less oxygen going into the atmosphere and that means less oxygen to weather rocks, less nutrients being released into the sea, which means less oxygenic photosynthesis. And that's what we call a negative feedback loop. There's lots of feedback loops in the Earth system, all feeding back on each other and counteracting each other in positive and negative ways. When I say positive and negative, I don't mean bad and good. I mean one goes one way and one goes the other way. I'm not judging any of these feedback loops. You know, they all have their place in the Earth system. Anyway, without larger fluxes of nutrients and oxygen, eukaryotes were stuck living in thin strips of relatively oxygen and nutrient rich areas near coastlines. The eukaryotes just couldn't compete with the bacteria who were living in the rest of the seas and oceans which liked these low oxygen, low nutrient conditions. So the eukaryotes were unable to spread out into new niches and evolve. In biology, this is sometimes called the red queen hypothesis because it means that the organism is having to run as fast as it can, and when I say run, I mean evolve, just to stay still, just to keep up. Lots of these hand gestures, you probably can't see my face. Silly me. Other researchers have suggested that the warm temperatures would have also inhibited the evolution of eukaryotes because the warm temperatures suggested for this interval are at the upper ranges that most micro eukaryotes and protists can tolerate because the biological reactions that happen in organisms like us have a limited temperature range. That's why your core body temperature is 37.5 degrees. If things get too hot or too cold, the reactions can't happen and you die. Warm seawater is also really bad at holding dissolved oxygen, which would have caused more problems. As well as using oxygen to metabolize, eukaryotes need oxygen to build biological structures, such as their cytoskeleton in the cell membrane, which is one of the things that allows them to make things like spikes and have bodies in interesting shapes. Low oxygen waters allow the buildup of sulfides, which are toxic to lots of micro eukaryotes, even in very small amounts. These environmental conditions would have kept the climate stable because one of the things that removes carbon dioxide from the atmosphere is when organisms use it for photosynthesis, then die after living a long, happy and fulfilling life and sink to the seabed where it gets buried for millions of years and or turned as oil or turned into limestone. This is one of the processes that helps to balance the Earth's climate. So when it gets too warm, the microorganisms pull the carbon out of the atmosphere and help cool it down again. It also helps stop the Earth having a runaway greenhouse effect. So this idea hypothesizes that during the boring billion, there was just enough life to stop the buildup of too much CO2 in the atmosphere, but not enough life to release significant amounts of oxygen and cause major climate change. The reason this is important for the oxygen story is because organic carbon, which is carbon bonded to itself and hydrogen, reacts with oxygen to form carbon dioxide, and that either gets released into the atmosphere or it gets buried and turned into limestone. If you've got more organic carbon than you have oxygen, all of your oxygen gets tied up in mineralizing that organic carbon, turning it into carbon dioxide or limestone. And so the oxygen can't build up in the atmosphere. So you need to produce more oxygen through oxygenic photosynthesis than there is organic carbon. So back in the mid Proterozoic, where you've got a lot of biology producing a little bit of oxygen, that means that there's much more organic carbon than there is oxygen and all of that oxygen is getting soaked up mineralizing the organic carbon and we know that because there's a lot of organic carbon still stored in the rocks as oil but was the boring billion even real science revises itself as it advances and we change our ideas with new data we tell the story of the data we don't fit the data to the story we want as more people have studied the Boring Billion and have uncovered more about life on Earth at this time, 
As more scientists have studied rocks from the time of the Boring Billion, we've uncovered more about life and Earth at this time, and that's starting to change our picture of what the world looked like back then. One example of this is my work <laughs> looking at nutrients in 1.4 billion year old rocks from Northern Australia. Instead of being nutrient poor, we found that the ancient seas of Northern Australia were actually relatively rich in nutrients like iron and phosphorus, and relatively poor in sulfides. Whereas previously we thought they were poor in phosphorus and other nutrients, moderately rich in iron and very rich in sulfides. Even in deep waters away from the coast, we find that there's very little sulfide, lots of iron and lots of phosphorus. There's actually so much iron and phosphorus that they're precipitating on the seabed as sediments and they're precipitating separately, which was a big surprise because previously we thought they'd form iron phosphates instead of a separate iron silicate and a separate phosphate. And that means that the phosphorus and iron were both available for use in biology. So these environments would have been ideal for micro eukaryotes. Subsequently, we are finding more and more micro eukaryote fossils from rocks of this time, even in the deep water environments where we thought that micro eukaryotes couldn't live. Other researchers around the world have been finding eukaryote fossils from this time as well. A nice example is this recent paper which shows these multicellular eukaryotes in rocks that are 1.6 billion years old from China, while these other researchers found possible macroalgae, as in fossils that you can see with the naked eye, in rocks that are 1.2 billion years old, also from China. Researchers looking at rocks from the Boring Billion in Northern Australia, but on the other side of Northern Australia from where I'm researching, have found very diverse eukaryote fossils in rocks from 1.61 billion years ago. And these were living in a shallow coastal environment and show that there were actually quite complex micro ecosystems happening at this time. And as exciting as this current paleontology research from the Boring Billion is, I'm really excited to see what's gonna come in the future. Who knows what fossils are there waiting to be found. Earlier I said that the oldest oil deposits in the world are from the Boring Billion, and these are some of the rocks that I studied, like the black shale I showed you earlier. Carbon burial on this scale would also alter the world's carbon and oxygen isotope ratios, because the burial of all that carbon would remove it from the short-term carbon cycle, and then there would be a subsequent release of oxygen, like we talked about earlier. The fact that we don't really see that in the carbon and oxygen isotope curves from this time from rocks in other places means that there must be an unknown process affecting the data and that could be geological overprinting or it could be something to do with the Earth's system at the time of deposition. We don't have the data to say for sure right now so we'll have to keep studying these rocks to try and work out what's going on. Finally, there might be something called preservation bias involved. I mentioned earlier that lots of sedimentary rocks from the Boring Billion were deposited into long-lived stable basins called cratonic basins. Cratons are very stable sections of continental crust and rocks. Craton sounds like crouton, and you can kind of think of them as croutons. Cratons are very stable sections of continental crust, and rocks deposited there are well protected from continental collisions compared to rocks on the edges of the continents. Rocks on the edges of continents get destroyed, recycled, and metamorphosed very frequently as part of the Earth's tectonic cycles. And I say frequently, I mean that in geological terms, <laughs> not in human terms. That would be catastrophic beyond imagining. This means that we could be getting a biased view of what Earth looked like during the Boring Billion because we're only able to sample these unusual locations. It'd be like if future geologists only had rock samples from places like the modern day Black Sea. They would think that all marine environments on Earth during our time were oxygen poor and sulfur rich and dominated by sulfur bacteria. They would never really know about the rich diversity of environments and life that existed in other marine environments at this time. The mid-Proterozoic was an interesting and unusual time in the history of our planet and the life that inhabits it. During this interval, we see the evolution and diversification of early eukaryotes, the transition of the ocean and atmosphere from the oxygen-poor Archean-style chemistry to the relatively oxygen-rich chemistry of the late Precambrian and Phanerozoic. There was even the formation and breakup of an entire supercontinent called Nuna. It was an interval of transition for almost every level of the Earth system. And with everything we know about it now, and we're continuing to learn about the mid-Proterozoic, you can't say that it was boring, unless you're an isotope geochemist. So there you go, a very quick skim through an interval of Earth's history known as the Boring Billion. I definitely think it needs a new name though, what about you? What would you call it? Let me know in the comments, and let me know about any other obscure bits of Earth history that you would like me to talk about. Don't forget to press those cursed buttons. Thanks for watching, have fun with your rocks and stay safe. Lay's potatoes.
that's a lie. <sighs> I don't think I'm ever gonna get over how much I hate doing that bit. Hallucinogenia fell off. Look, is my talking really that annoying, Hallucinogenia? Thanks, I used to think you were cool. Tell me why it is so strange. Mm. It's too big a toppy for it. Toppy? It's too big. Isotope geochemistry. ASMR. Canyon Diablo Troilight. Vienna PD Belemonite. Ah, oh, yes. Maximals. Through Earth's history, people forget that. Am I swatting a fly? Or am I imitating the isotope curves, amoebas, or apes? You're all welcome. Hooray, did it. Maxime has entered the lab. The, uh, floating around on the mantle, even though the mantle's not liquid. It's not really a very good analogy, is it? It's just funny to imagine. 